Welcome everyone to the Booten Homes Public Library's Happy Hour. We are delighted to welcome Landy Simone, uh, master beekeeper and owner of Goose Rock Farms in Montville. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a, a local, um, a well-known local farm. And although I have never been, I have heard much about a honey hut that's on the premises. Is that what it's called? It's actually the honey house, but the honey yeah. house. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people call it the honey hut. Okay. Probably more accurate. <laughs> so Lottie, he, um, Landy is here to tell us about uh, keeping honeybees. And I'm going to let Landy take it away. You may have heard, we'll take questions during the program, but please keep yourself muted and type your questions into the chat. Uh, um, I'll be watching there for questions. And if you have any technical issues, that sort of thing, uh, you can type that into chat too, and we'll do our best to help you out there. All right, thank you. And Landy, it's all yours. Okay, so um, I'm happy to be here tonight. I, I love the Booten Homes Library. Um, I actually love the architecture of it. And I am a, um, a patron, library patron for, oh God, 35 years I've lived in this area. Um, tonight I'm going to share with you a little bit about honeybees and also some of their relatives because they do get mistaken for um, a lot of other critters around here in the Hymenoptera order. So I figured I would try and dispel maybe some of the um, misunderstandings about those. Um, my background, I, I own Goose Rock Farm in Montville, um, which has been here for some 20 odd years. Um, we have a little self-service honey house where I sell local honeys, raw honey, um, from my own bees in the area. I manage about 100, about 100 colonies of bees. Um, I raise queens, I sell starter hives, nucleus colonies to other beekeepers in northern New Jersey. and. Um, I'm one of about, I think, six certified EAS master beekeepers in the state of New Jersey. I'm also the current chair of the certification committee. So I'm in charge of testing other, testing candidates who would like to become master beekeepers. And that's, a, that's an East Coast thing. That's with the Eastern Apiculture Society. So um, I've been keeping bees for 24 years now. Um, I do do it for a living and um, I enjoy it a great deal. And I hope I can share some of that with you. Okay, I'm gonna get my slides up here. Um, share screen, there. That, that's the screen. Okay, here we go. That's what we want. All right. Can you guys see this? Somebody's got to unmute themselves and let me know if. Yes, we can. Okay, cool. All right, and you can see my you can see me up in the corner there too, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm not going to teach you beekeeping today, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about honeybees. Um, actually, keeping bees is not an easy thing to do. It's, it's far more complicated and difficult than chickens. Um, Annie and I were talking earlier about, you know, both of us keep chickens. I've had chickens since my kids were, were little, and I'm now a grandmother. Um, but chickens are easy. Goats are easy. You give them food, shelter, protection from predators. And you go out and you harvest your delicious eggs um, or get your milk. Honeybees, not like that. You need quite a bit of knowledge just to keep them alive. Um, and, you know, much less actually get a honey harvest. So, in fact, in the state of New Jersey, as of 2018, Taking a short course in beekeeping is required by law. You, you can't just go out and buy bees and start keeping bees. You actually have to have education um, in order to do so legally. So 
let's talk a little bit about honeybees. I'm just going to give you like an overview. And uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and, and I will answer. Okay, so first question I'd like to ask and answer is, what is a honeybee and what isn't a honeybee? Because an awful lot of people think insects that are not honeybees are bees. Um, and in fact, there's only two bees on this slide. This picture shows um, a bunch of wasps and hornets and two bees, which are the honeybee on the lower left and the bumblebee on the lower right. Okay, so all of these other insects, which are very common in our area, are not bees at all. They're types of wasps. So they're related to honeybees, but it's kind of like, okay, Tucker, my cat was up here earlier. It's sort of like calling Tucker a tiger, <laughs> right? He's related to a tiger, okay? But he's not a tiger. They're very different animals. Same genus, okay? Really different species. And we have the same thing here. All of these are in the order Hymenoptera, uh, which includes bees, wasps, and ants but they are not bees, okay? These are wasps. Are they valuable? Yes, they are, okay? All bees, wasps, hornets are valuable to the ecosystem. They do pollinate. Um, not only do they pollinate, but they, they um, most, most types of wasps are either parasitic or predatory. So they're really good at, um, keeping pests down in our gardens. Um, they're very important to the ecosystem. Most wasps are so tiny, we don't even see them. It's just the bigger ones like, like yellow jackets and bald-faced hornets that um, uh, you know, we come into contact with mostly. And an awful lot of people call yellow jackets bees, but they're not, they are a type of wasp. So, um, there's a couple of species, particularly yellow jackets, that do pose a threat to humans. But most of them, if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. And they, they serve valuable functions, particularly in our gardens. Um, so let's take a somewhat closer look at some of these not honeybees. OK, paper wasps, first of all. Paper wasps, I like paper wasps. They're, they're just kind of cool. There's two main species in our area. There's the, the northern paper wasp, which are also called red wasps, and the European paper wasp on the right, okay. And the nest, there's a picture of their nest on the bottom here. So it's rarely very large. It's usually only about, oh, four or five inches, at the most six inches in diameter. And it's attached by a stem uh, to the underside of a structure, maybe, you know, your eave on your house or the bottom of your barbecue or a picnic table or something like that. So, and they, you know, they will raise uh, young wasps inside that paper nest that they've constructed. But paper wasps are pretty mellow guys. Um, you don't normally, you, you have to work hard to get stung by a paper wasp. So the northern paper wasp is often confused with yellow jackets. So I've got pictures of them up here on top. How do you tell the difference? Because they're similarly colored. Well, when they're flying, paper wasps have those really long legs that dangle down. And they've also got that characteristic wasp waist, the extremely thin waist. Waste, uh, whereas yellow jackets are, you know, definitely more substantial, and they their legs don't dangle down the way paper wasps do. They hold them close to their body when they fly. Um, there's another photo of the nest. Uh, they are like all wasps, able to sting multiple times, but they're really not defensive. So, just as an example, on top of my hives, I keep a brick. You know, the brick keeps, helps keep the lid from blowing off in really bad storms. Um, and I have like a system of whether, you know, they're queen right, need to be supered and so on, depending on how I position the brick. So some of the bricks have holes in them. And 
Paper wasps like to build nests in the holes in my bricks that are on top of my hives. When I go to inspect the hive, right, I need to move the brick. I can go, I can pick up that brick with the wasp and the nests inside and just move it over to the next hive and then pop the lid and inspect my bees, you know, put the lid back on, get the same brick and, you know, put it back on. And the wasps are like, oh, hi there. Oh, you want us to move? No problem, you know. So I find it's very unusual for paper wasps to actually sting somebody. Uh, you, you, you'd have to like swat them or, you know, harm them in some way or directly threaten the nest. And, you know, if I had a stinger and you did that to me, I would also sting you. So next, um, most common species I'm going to say in our area is the bald-faced hornet. Now, they're also known as white-faced hornets. They're a little bit bigger than paper wasps, uh, maybe an inch. And they're a little bit more defensive, but, and they, they can build huge nests. I saw a photograph of a nest in Ohio in a barn that must have been there for quite a long time. I guess it was protected enough from the elements that the wasps didn't die out over the winter, which they usually do. And this nest was so large that a man could actually fit inside of it. So that was pretty wild. Uh, Bald-faced hornets, as long as they're not like right next to your back door, they're probably not going to bother you. If you've got a nest that's 10 or 15 feet up in a tree in your backyard, they will totally ignore you. Um, you know, if it's right next to your door, that may be a little bit too close and you may want to have that nest removed. Um, so I'd say they're a bit more defensive than paper wasps, but not really defensive. Okay, European hornets. Um, these gals are about an inch and a half long. So this is a pretty big wasp. And last year, I think it was last year when we started getting all that publicity about murder hornets right on the West Coast in Washington State. I got so many phone calls from people saying they'd seen a murder hornet in their backyard. And did I want to come over and kill it? <laughs> and not murder hornets, okay? It was European hornets, always European hornets. Murder hornets are, the, the, the Asian giant hornet is not here. Um, European hornets are also pretty mellow. They, they do, they form nests mostly in cavities. Um, so you don't often see the nests like a hollow tree. Um, but, um, but they are social insects, they're not solid wasps, and they, you know, they do have colonies. Um, I've never seen a bunch of them together, but sometimes when we're making sugar syrup to feed bees in the fall to make sure they have enough to get through the winter, European hornets will come around to sample the syrup along with everything else in the area. We can go down and like scoop them out barehanded and just kind of set them to the side. And I've never been stung by one. Um, I've heard that the sting packs a wallop, which doesn't surprise me. It's a very large insect. Um, right, it looks like a yellow jacket on steroids. It's really quite big. Um, and I think I, think I talked all about that already. Right, the Asian giant hornet, okay. Oh, Landy? Yes, uh, we do have a question. I believe it was about the um, the insect before the European hornet. Um, All faced hornets, this one. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the question is, are these the ones we see hanging on trees in wintertime? I think the nests is what they're referring to. Um, either bald faced hornet nests or yellow jacket nests. They look very similar. Okay, the bald-faced hornet nests tend to be a little more gray in color. Yellow jacket nests are a little more tan in color. And those nests will be abandoned, okay? There won't be any insects in them. They don't go back to the same ne nest next spring. Okay, so in winter, after you've had a really hard frost, you can knock that nest down and nobody will come out and, you know, call you on it. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, 
Right. The, yes, the Asian giant hornet came from Japan, uh, where honeybees are adapted to it. It's probably not going to get out here. It's probably not going to get any further than California in the next 20 years. Okay. If they're unsuccessful in eradicating them in Washington state, which they are trying to do. But we've got deserts in between. Um, bottom line, we don't have them in New Jersey. And it's extremely unlikely that we'll get them in New Jersey anytime soon, which is a good thing because, you know, hopefully they won't get here until after I retire. <laughs> we got enough to deal with. Cicada killers. Have any of you guys heard cicadas? I haven't heard any cicadas and it's year 17 for cicadas. So we haven't gotten them up here yet. I know they're in South Jersey, but I don't think they're up here. Um, this is a wasp. The cicada killer is a very large wasp, two inches. So it's even bigger than a European hornet. And it, it does hunt cicadas and provision its nest with cicadas. So its behavior is very typical of predatory wasps where um, they will, you know, find the prey, bring the prey to the nest, uh, paralyze the prey by stinging it, uh, lay an egg, and the egg hatches, develop the larva, you know, and the larva will eat the prey um, and develop on the prey. So cicada killers do this. Uh, they're actually solitary insects, but they like to congregate. So you'll often find a lot of nests in the same area. They're more common in the southern part of the state where the sandy soil is prevalent, um, you know, as opposed to up here in the highlands. So, um, but they're cool. They're, they're pretty cool. I saw a whole bunch of them once at the University of Delaware when I went to a beekeeping conference there. There were we had, there was one area just like full of cicada killers, pretty neat. And they must be going to town this year. Okay, yellow jackets, all too common in New Jersey. Yes, and they don't care about sandy soil, clay soil, they're, uh, they're everywhere. And as you know, they're highly defensive. They are responsible for more stinging incidents than any other insect in our area. Um, there are two main species, the German yellow jacket and the common aerial yellow jacket. The German yellow jacket is probably more of a bad actor than the other one, but both of them are pretty defensive. The German yellow jacket, okay, that's the one on the left, nests in cavities. And inside that cavity, it builds a paper nest. So the aerial yellow jacket builds its paper nest in a shrub, you know, under the eaves of your house in the branches of a tree, but out in the open. German yellow jacket builds it inside of a cavity. So it's the German yellow jacket that you're going to encounter when you're mowing your lawn and you accidentally get too close to the nest and they all come out and um, tell you in no uncertain terms that you need to go away or, or they're going to um, make you regret it. And they do. Um, they can sting multiple times and they are highly defensive. Not aggressive, defensive. What they're doing is they're defending their nest, but they have a very large radius around the nest that they consider their territory. Okay, unlike my paper wasps who, you know, I could pick up their nest basically and move them around, you know, so they are not very defensive. Yellow jackets are quite defensive. Um, and in late summer, like in August, when food sources become scarce, I get so many calls. I've got a bee's nest in my backyard. Do you want, I don't want to kill them. I know bees are important. Can you come and take them away? And I ask what the nest looks like. And they tell me it's like paper, you know, shaped like a football. And it's not, not bees. These are wasps. Yellow jackets are not bees. Um, they don't survive the winter. Like bald-faced hornets, the nest dies, unless it's in a protected area. If it's in your, your furnace room inside your house in the basement, somehow they got in there, you know, that nest could live over the winter. But 
normal outside nests, not going to survive the winter. Only um, the mated queens live through the winter. They will find like a protected area under the bark of a tree or something, and they survive the winter um, and then um, start a new colony next spring. Um, okay. All right, bees. <laughs> Let's talk about actual bees. Okay, two bees, very common. The larger ones in our area are the carpenter bee, eastern carpenter bee, and the eastern bumblebee. And as I sat down here on my back porch, there was in fact a carpenter bee um, working on a nest up in the eave over my porch. But I consider my house to be a multifamily dwelling, so I don't can't bring myself to do anything about the carpenter bees um, and bumblebees. They look very similar, okay. But if you take a good look, okay, the carpenter bees have this very shiny black abdomen that distinguishes them, and their the fur, their hair on their thorax is a little bit deeper yellow. Bumblebees are fuzzier all around, and they're more of a light yellow or a tannish yellow in color. They're both about the same size. Um, very different behavior, though. Bumblebees, like German yellow jackets, nest in cavities. Okay, so they build nests um, in cavities underground. Not they they don't build paper nests um, like all bees. They they build like a wax nest or not all bees build wax nests, but but bumblebees build little wax pots actually, which they provision with nectar and pollen and uh, and raise larvae in. So they're they're pretty cool, but but they will find like an underground chipmunk hole or you know rodent nest and build a nest in there or a cavity in you know uh, a um a bunch of logs that type of thing carpenter bees okay carpenter bees nest in wood tunnels that the females drill in your house or other wooden areas if, if you keep your house well painted they tend not to like the paint so that discourages them, um, but they, you know, they do, they do build these, they drill these perfect, perfect round holes um, that go into the wood a little bit, about half an inch, and then they make a right angle and they will continue to drill, okay, uh, perpendicular to the first hole and lay an egg, provision the nest, make a little um, barrier, then lay another egg. And so they'll have perhaps half a dozen um, larvae that they that they uh, have put in that one hole. Um, and of course, the males will try and psych you out. They're very territorial and they're the ones that will come and kind of hover at eye level and like stare at you. And they actually are focusing on your eyes. So but they don't have stingers. So all they're doing is trying to psych you out. They can't actually do anything about it. They can't sting you. Um, so don't, you know, don't get disturbed by them. They're, they're harmless, totally harmless. They're just trying to be all brave and bold and <laughs> make you go away. <laughs> so you don't bother the female in her nesting endeavors. Um, we have a question about yes. bumblebees. Okay. Are, are the bumblebees solitary? Okay, no, they're not. They're social, but they're not eusocial like honeybees. So bumblebees nest together in groups of perhaps a hundred, okay, as opposed to the thousands um, of individuals in a honeybee nest. There are and, and they don't, when I say they're social, but not use social, they don't have a reproductive division of labor. So in a honeybee nest, there are individuals which, whose sole responsibility is to reproduce. That's not true in a bumblebee nest. A lot of females will 
occupy that nest together and the nests are much smaller. So they're social, but they're not quite as evolved as um, insects like honeybees and ants, which are eusocial, also wasps. So hopefully that answers to your question. Um, Actually, I have a question. What yes. do the bees drill with? <laughs> That's a really good question. I don't know. I really don't know. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like they're good at it though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, ask me a question about honeybees and I can answer, but, <laughs> you know, and I certainly know more about these guys than your average person, but I really don't know how they do that. And I don't know that I've ever even read how they do that. <laughs> we have, oops, we have a, uh, Another question okay. about bumblebees. Back okay. to the bumblebees. Can Back bumblebees bumble. sting more than once? Um, yes. Bumblebees have smooth stingers. So they can withdraw it and sting you again, like wasps. Honeybees cannot. All right, good to know. Um, but bumblebees, pretty much any forager, any bee or wasp that you find on a flower gathering nectar or pollen is not gonna bother you. Um, I have bumblebees here that like to hang out on my echinacea, my purple coneflower. Um, and, and sometimes it gets chilly in the evening because the coneflowers, you know, bloom later, a little later in the season. If it gets too chilly for the bumblebees to fly home, they'll be there overnight. And in the morning I'll come out and I, I can pet them. You know, you can go right up to them and just kind of give them a little pet and they sort of shake and say, oh, okay, hi. <laughs> but I've never ever been stung by a bumblebee on a flower or any insect on a flower. You have to try to get stung by them. If you swat at them, if you smack at them, if you go like this, ah, go away, you'll get stung. You know, if you're calm and you leave them alone, they will actually leave you alone too. Okay, native bees. We have roughly 4,000 species of native bees in the United States. And most of them are quite small and you won't notice them, but there are leaf cutter bees, plasterer bees, digger bees. I've had a couple of calls about digger bees this year. They look very much like honeybees, just a tiny bit smaller, but they go into holes in the ground um, and they have colonies in holes in the ground. So they're kind of cool. Sweat bees are the little itty bitty tiny green ones that are iridescent um, and they're, there are a lot of very, very neat native pollinators um, and all of them appreciate anything you might wanna grow for them. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But finally, we get to honeybees, okay? <laughs> Half an hour into this talk and we're just starting to talk about honeybees. All I ask, okay, for those of you out there is if you're calling, anything that flies around and looks like it might sting you, a bee, stop doing that, okay? <laughs> Don't call a yellow jacket a bee. All right. <sighs> These are the California almonds, honey beehives in almond pollination. I have friends that go out and do almond pollination every February. Um, why are honeybees so important? And they are. They're important because they are critical to our current system of agriculture. They are the only insect that we can raise in wooden boxes and have 30 to 60,000 individuals put those boxes on a flatbed truck, 500 of them on a truck and drive them across the country to pollinate 700, million acres of almonds in California, or the cranberries and blueberries in Southern New Jersey, or the apples in Washington state or New York state. So because we raise crops in a monoculture system, 
with acres and acres and acres, tens of thousands of acres of the same kind of plant. Okay, we have to have a pollinator that we can put in the middle of that crop to pollinate the crop. Native pollinators are wonderful, but we can't do that with them. We can do a little bit of it with bumblebees. Okay, there are people who raise bumblebee colonies for greenhouse pollination. Um, tomatoes, okay, greenhouse tomatoes, hothouse tomatoes are pollinated by bumblebees. They actually have longer proboscis and can get into deeper flowers than honeybees can. But, you know, you've got like a colony of about 100 and they only last a couple of weeks. So um, they're not going to do the almonds out in California. Also, native pollinators require a diverse habitat. Okay, you can't, um, they don't, they wouldn't survive in an almond grove um, or in the blueberries. So we are, because of the way we grow our food, it makes us totally dependent on honeybees for pollination. Yeah, 1.6 million acres of almonds is what our California crop was in 2020. It's actually the largest commercial crop in the world, not just the United States, but the world. Um, and it took two and a half million hives of bees to pollinate them. So that's an important, very important business. Pollination industry is worth about $20 billion in the United States. So would we starve without, oh, by the way, Einstein never said that humans would be extinct in four years if honeybees were extinct. So that's kind of a fun thing, but unfortunately not true. Um, and we wouldn't starve if honeybees suddenly went extinct, but we'd be a lot less healthy and our diets would be much more boring. Um, what does not require honeybee pollination is grains. So things like corn, rice, um, wheat, those crops do not require honeybee pollination because they're wind pollinated. Um, and some, some things like peaches, the nectar is so um, sweet that it attracts a lot of different pollinators. So people growing peach orchards often don't bring honeybees in because so many things find peaches attractive. But they're very, I think they, you know, they left peaches in here. There are very few fruits and vegetables like that. Um, most things require honeybees for pollination. Um, almost all the fruits and a lot of vegetables too. Things like um, some of them just for seed, like carrots and onions. I, you know, okay, you know how important they are. So what is a honeybee? Well, it's an individual insect, okay? There's on, in this picture here, that's the queen on the left. I spent today catching and marking queens in my queen mating colonies. I raise queens and I, I love that job. It's a lot of fun. I, I get to look for the queens, find them, pick them up and put a little white dot on their thorax. So this is to make it easier for, for people to find later. Um, the one in the middle is a drone. Okay, drones, the much larger eyes, kind of a squared off body, larger than a worker. Um, not as big as a queen who has a very long abdomen full of ovarials with um, eggs um, and the worker who does just about everything in the hive, almost everything. Um, drones, this time of year, right now, we might have 60,000 workers in a typical hive, about a couple of thousand drones because it's spring and one queen. Okay, so they are individual insects, but a honeybee colony biologically is considered a superorganism. So the colony does things that individual organisms do. It gathers food, it finds and builds shelter, it defends itself and it reproduces as a colony. 
Um, the individual bees are, insects are not particularly important to the colony and will willingly and immediately sacrifice themselves if they think that that's called for. So these are some of my bees in Pine Brook um, down on Hook Mountain Road and um, managed bees, bees in hives as opposed to bees in the wild nesting in a tree um, are possible because of something discovered by a um, Presbyterian minister named Lorenzo Lorraine Langstroth, who was bipolar, lived in Philadelphia, and discovered the concept of the B space. So the B space is a distance of between a quarter and three eighths of an inch. And if you position hive components that distance apart, bees will neither build comb in there or fill it with a sticky, sticky substance called propolis, which they like to glue things together with. They'll leave it open. So you can, if you do that, you can remove frames. See, that's, I'm looking at a frame down here um, and inspect them without hurting the bees. You can harvest honey without killing the colony. Um, before this time, beekeepers kept bees in any number of different structures like clay pots, um, upside down baskets called skeps, which I'm sure you've seen pictures of. It's, it's illegal to keep bees in skeps because you can't remove the frames to inspect them. Um, um, the Egyptians were keeping bees in clay pots some 5,000 years ago. Um, and I was talking with a Facebook friend of mine from Ethiopia today who said to tell you guys hi, um, a beekeeper, and he, keep, he and his African friends keep bees in woven baskets that are elevated in trees. So, but the bee space was very important, and I get to keep my bees in wooden hives, which I can, they're open top and bottom, and I stack them. As the colony grows, I can give them more boxes with frames so that they can um, build up and have enough room for all their needs. Um, bees secrete beeswax and they make their nest using beeswax. So young bees between the ages of about um, eight days and 15 days have wax glands on their abdomens that um, eight of them, and they will secrete these little tiny chips of wax and build this beautiful hexagonal comb. Now we beekeepers give them a sheet of wax foundation in the middle of this frame and they'll build it out on either side. The center of this is brood, okay, this particular frame, and it's surrounded by a perimeter of pollen. And outside that, we've got um, honey. And that's how they like to organize things inside the brood nest. Um, and they also, they have an organization vertically as well and side to side. So they like to put honey on the outside, frames of pollen inside the honey, and then the brood in the middle. They like the pollen very close to the brood because they need it to feed the brood. And above, they like to put honey, which makes it possible for me to harvest surplus honey that they don't need because they store all of that surplus above the brood nest. And I can go and remove the bees and just take boxes of honey because um, they don't stop. If there's a good nectar flow, you know, and they need 60 pounds of honey to get through the winter, they'll put away 60 pounds of honey. But if there's nectar still flowing, they don't say, okay, I think we're done now. We've got enough to make it through the winter. Let's rest. They just keep on gathering nectar and making honey. So if they put away 160 pounds, I have 100, 100 pounds that I can take and extract and put in jars and put out in the honey house for you guys to go and buy. Uh, Landy, question. Yes. yes. How do you know what is surplus honey? Ah, that's a good question. It takes experience. I actually, I will lift the boxes. I know how heavy they should be. 
Okay. So I will always leave enough for the bees. Um, and I'll even, I will even feed them to make sure that they have enough, but that's after any honey has been harvested. We sometimes get a fall flow and we sometimes don't. I don't count on that fall flow to make um, food for the bees. You know, if we get it, it's a bonus, but I make sure that they're gonna have enough for the winter um, regardless of whether there's a fall flow or not. Okay. Yeah. And my losses last year were 2%, same the year before, which is pretty good. Um, what does that mean, your losses? It means that of 100 colonies of bees that I, that were alive at the beginning of the winter, two of them were not in spring. Ah, okay. okay. All right. Thank you. That's actually very unusual. The average loss throughout the United States is something like 35%. Oh, wow. That sounds great then. Oh, we got another question just now. Excellent. Do you harvest the honey once or twice a year? Uh -huh. That depends on whether I get a fall flow or not. I've actually just started harvesting. Usually I harvest in July, right around mid-July. Nectar flows, spring nectar flows, it's all over but the shouting. And I'll go and begin to harvest. Um, if if we get a nice fall flow of goldenrod and Japanese bamboo, don't cringe gardeners, but it makes a delicious dark honey. Um, I'll harvest again in October. Okay, any more questions? We good? All right, let's talk about these bees individually, what they do. So worker bees, as you might imagine, do all the work. Um, they live four to six weeks during the growing season, longer in winter. And it's pretty cool how they decide what work they're going to do. There are two criteria. One is the needs of the colony. So if there's a ton of nectar coming in and there just aren't enough bees of the right age to, to get the nectar, a whole bunch of others will be recruited to go out and get nectar. But the main way that they decide what they have to do is based on their age. It's called age polyethism, which is just a fancy way of saying that you get to, as soon as you come out of your cell, your job is to clean your cell. Then you're going to feed larvae. And you'll feed larvae until you're maybe a week old. Once you're a week old, you'll start secreting wax from your abdomen. And, and, and you're, you're gonna clean cells. And then you're going to ripen honey. And once you get to be about three weeks old, you will guard the nest. So you'll become a guard bee. And then after that, you'll be a forager. So it's pretty cool. But they can change those things depending on the needs of the colony. So if there's a lot of brood to feed, more bees will feed brood um, and so on. It, it, it's a very neat thing. So here's pictures, okay. These are nurse bees feeding brood. The, the nurse bees actually, they eat pollen, which is their protein source, and they secrete brood food from special glands. So they make the food in hypopharyngeal and mandibular glands, glands in their head that are exclusively devoted to making food for the young. One larva could be visited as many as 2000 times by a nurse bee before she's ready to become a pupa. So here's a picture of wax production. This bee is, is grabbing a, a little flake of wax with her mandibles from her abdomen and she will shape that into the hexagonal comb. She'll use her front legs and her mandibles to do that. Um, and this is a guard bee at the entrance to the hive in a very characteristic pose with her, um, her head up, her antennae um, you know, alert and her front legs elevated. And she's checking people's ID as they come in. So if a bee wants to come in and she doesn't smell right, she doesn't smell like the hive, the guard bee's job is to eject her. 
or if a wasp tries to get in, you know, yellow jacks will try and come in and um, steal honey and brood. Um, and it's the guard, the guard bees will take care of business and make sure nobody gets in. They're like, you know, the bouncers at a bar. Now, um, question about the guard yeah. bees. Yeah. So they'll eject a, hun a, a honeybee that is not from their hive. Yes, um, unless she's yeah. bearing gifts. Ah. <laughs> if, she's got, if she has a nice load of nectar <laughs> or pollen, they may let her in. Um, and also drones can go anywhere. So you, the guys are welcome no matter where they go. Um, and there is a certain amount of drifting from hive to hive. So if the wind is blowing this way, um, you know, and bees are coming in from the field with loads of nectar and pollen, some of them will wind up in the wrong hive. Um, some might get stopped by guard bees, but my own experience is a lot of them just kind of go wherever by accident. They try and get back to their own hives, but it doesn't always happen. Um, now, will the wrong, uh, a bee going to um, the wrong hive, might it do damage to that hive or no, it just ends up in the wrong hive? No, no, she wouldn't do damage. She, I mean, the, the worst risk would be she would be killed or rejected. Ah, okay. She, on her own, she can't do anything. She's okay. one little bee, yeah. So what do bees gather when they forage? When they, when they graduate to being foragers at three weeks of age, okay, what is it that they get? Because um, they will forage until they die. And usually they die in the field because their wings become so tattered from flying that they can't make it back to the hive. Um, they collect water because every living organism needs water. So you'll see bees down you know, by the side of a stream, actually sucking up water, usually from the mud at the perimeter of a stream or a pond. Um, they like dirty water because it contains minerals, which they can use. So um, you'd be surprised. Like we, we get problems with honeybees going to swimming pools because they like the chlorine or the salt. Um, if I need to provide a water source, in my apiaries, because there isn't water there, I always make sure to put a little bit of sea salt in there um, and um, a drop or two of chlorine. Sometimes I'll, I'll take like a, um, a salt lick for horses and like kind of put it near the perimeter. Bees like that and, and they need that. Um, they collect nectar, of course, that's their carbohydrate source. So nectar is the sugary substance that flowering plants produce that are insect pollinated. And they make that sugary substance to attract pollinators. Um, they collect pollen. Pollen is the bee's protein source. They are vegetarians, unlike wasps and hornets that have a carnivorous larval stage which is why you'll find yellow jackets hanging out at your picnic, you know, trying to eat your hamburgers. The, the adults are vegetarians, but they gather meat and animal protein in order to feed the, the larvae of the wasps. Honeybees, no, okay. Honeybees eat pollen, make food for the brood. Everybody is a vegetarian. Um, and propolis, propolis is a resin that bees gather from trees. And they're, they're pre it's pretty cool. It's like an exterior immune system. They use it for a lot of things to glue hive components together and make my life difficult as I try and get them apart. Um, but it's antimicrobial. It kills bacteria, fungi, and viruses. So they use it as a sort of an external immune system because it kills germs. Um, if a mouse maybe gets into the hive in winter time while the bees are all clustered together and can't move around very much, um, the, and then it warms up and the bees sting the mouse and the mouse dies in the hive, well, a mouse body is way too big for honeybees to be dragging out. So they will embalm it in propolis. I have, I have a, a mouse mummy that I'll show to my beekeeping students 
uh, which is, it's a pretty cool thing. So it can't, you know, it can't give off germs. It can't make anybody sick if it's embalmed in propolis. Um, yes. Okay, there's pollen. You can see that's the pro that comes all different colors and they will mix it with a little bit of nectar and actually ferment it into bee bread. So sort of like yogurt that helps to preserve it. Um, this is nectar, okay, before it's been capped. Bees add enzymes, particularly an enzyme called, um, um, glucose oxidase, which acts on the glucose portion of the nectar. Nectar is composed of glucose, sucrose, and fructose, and it converts it to glycogen and hydrogen peroxide. So honey is actually antimicrobial too. And before they discovered penicillin, like during World War I, a soldier would be wounded, they would pack the wound with honey because it kills, it kills germs. Um, if I get a bad scrape or, or cut or something, I don't put Neosporin on it, I put honey on it. Works very well, great on burns too. Um, but in the nest, okay, in the beehive, uh, honey provides carbohydrates for energy. So this photo on the left is uncapped honey. The bees are still ripening their honey because of course nectar is roughly 80% or more water and it's got to get down to about 80% solids. Honey is 18, no more than 18.6% moisture. Once it's ripe, once, okay, Tucker, don't you step on the keys of the laptop. <laughs> once the honey is ripe and ready, they put a lid on, it's like a little cap on it, a little wax cap. It's like putting the lid on the jar of your preserves. It's ready, it's done, and they'll save that. They talk to each other, okay. Can you tell bees are absolutely amazing animals? They have a language, it, a chemical language and a dance language. So these bees up here on the left are raising their abdomens and fanning a pheromone, a pheromone called Nazanoff pheromone. And there's a gland right at the tip of the abdomen that produces this pheromone. Um, the pheromone says, here we are, come on over here. Hey gals, okay, let's party to this way, everybody gather. And it helps them to stay together, okay, as a group. Then they have a dance language. So they will, on the comb, describe a figure eight and by virtue of this language, they can tell their sisters exactly where a food source is. So basically they're saying, okay, go out of the hive, turn 20 degrees to the right of the sun and fly for a mile and a half and you'll see this great stand of goldenrod and here's a sample this is what it tastes like so that's what you're looking for and i kid you not that is exactly what they're telling their sisters it's pretty wild um carl von fritz won the nobel prize for describing the dance language of honeybees um back in i think 1946 not positive about the date, but um, but uh, he did win that. He he won the Nobel Prize. Amazingly sophisticated language, um, particularly the pheromones. The chemical language is incredible. I, I just I gave you one as an example, but there are dozens and dozens of pheromones. Um, reproductive division of labor. So the queen. Here's a queen right here. Okay, that's a nice big long one. She is solely responsible for laying eggs. Okay, the only individual who can do that. If she fertilizes an egg, it gives rise to a female, either a worker or a queen. If she does not fertilize the egg, it gives rise to a male, a drone. That's called parthenogenesis and it's common among hymenoptera. Wasps have the same thing. So she may lay as many as 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. A lot of, you know, if I, I'm not ovulating anymore, but if I ever ovulated that much, I'll tell you, I think I'd want to retire right away. <laughs> Drones don't do anything. They're basically flying sperm packets. That's about the size of it. And their sole responsibility is to pass on the genetic material of the colony. Um, the queen produces pheromones 
and lays eggs. She's, she doesn't tell anybody what to do. Queen is kind of a misnomer for her. She's more of a, you know, egg laying, pheromone producing slave. The workers tell her what to do, where to lay, how many drones to lay. Uh, she doesn't have any say over it. Honeybees like butterflies and moths undergo complete metamorphosis. Okay, so they start life as an egg. This is a frame of eggs, much enlarged. Believe me, they're really hard to see. They're extremely tiny, like little tiny grains of rice. Um, now that I'm getting older, I have to put my reading glasses on under my veil in order to see eggs. Um, they spend three days as an egg, and then the outer membrane of this egg kind of dissolves. They don't really hatch, but it dissolves and reveals a larva. Okay, worker bees will remain as a larva for six days. And once that six days is up, um, they will spin a cocoon inside the cell and become a pupa. So the worker bees, the other worker bees, the adults will put a little cap on this cell. You saw pictures of it earlier when I showed you the picture of that frame, that center tan part was capped brood. And this is what happens under those cappings. This is the cappings on top, sliced, you know, sideways. Start as a, they spin the cocoon and begin to change, just like a butterfly does, okay? This bee here is almost ready to emerge. Okay, we have a question. Yes. How long does the queen live? Ah, that's a really good question. She lives longer than anybody else. They don't live as long as they used to for a variety of reasons. Um, two years is about as long as I see queens living nowadays. Many years ago, 20 years ago, I had a queen that I had for, I think about five years. But nowadays, one to two years is much more typical. And drones will live a few months. Um, so, the times of development are different for workers, queens, and drones, but they all undergo this complete metamorphosis. And that's Tucker. <laughs> so the queen is the mother of all the bees in the colony. She goes on one single mating flight early on in her life. And during that mating flight, she will obtain all the sperm that she is going to use during her entire egg laying career. And she stores it in a special organ in her body called a spermatheca. So I told you before, if she fertilizes the egg, which she can do as she's laying it, it becomes a female. And if she doesn't fertilize it, it becomes a male. Queens develop in special cells. They kind of look like peanuts, but they're oriented vertically versus horizontally the way worker and drone cells are oriented. And um, they're very cool. Queens are fed royal jelly for life. And that is the only difference between a queen and a worker. It's that during her development in this special queen cell, um, she gets only royal jelly, which is brood food with a higher mandibular gland component and a lower hypopharyngeal gland component. If a regular worker bee is gonna get made, they get a different diet than the queen. Um, <clears throat> and if anybody tries to sell you royal jelly telling you that it's going to make you young and get rid of all your wrinkles, um, they're full of, you know what, because it's not true. No scientific evidence to support that royal jelly is good for anybody but queen bees. But it's good for queens. Oops, I'm sorry, question. Yes. Yes. Now, the queen. So yeah. how does the next queen emerge? Does the current queen lay an egg knowing, or I don't know if knowing is the right word, but um, knowing that it's going to be the next queen, like because she's on her way out? How does it happen? Yes, yes, that's a really good question. And there's actually three ways that new queens can be created. One is just as you've described. We've got an older queen, she's running out of sperm, okay? So what happens when she starts to run out of sperm? She begins to lay drones in worker size cells. She intended to fertilize the egg, but no sperm was there. So it became a drone instead. 
and the workers will realize this, that queen will cooperate in her own replacement. So they have special like kind of beginning queen cups, uh, queen cells that are called queen cups and the queen will lay an egg in there and that queen will be raised, you know, fed and developed while the old queen is still in the hive and, um, and the new queen will emerge. She'll fly out, she'll mate, she'll come back mother and daughter will lay side by side for a period of time and then the old queen will just kind of disappear okay so the new one takes over the second way that they will raise a new queen is under emergency conditions so here i am clumsy beekeeper i'm looking at these bees in this frame i accidentally shake the frame and the queen falls off and i step on her whoops Okay, all of a sudden this hive is queenless. So those queens will choose a very young female larva under three days of age, because under three days of age, everybody gets royal jelly and continue to feed that young larva royal jelly. They'll draw the cell out into a vertical configuration and create a queen. So that's a queen created under emergency conditions. And the third way is swarming, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So I'll cover that in a second. Thank you. This is fascinating. I know it there. I, I could go on forever, you know, I, but I'm not going to. <laughs> They're amazing animals. I mean, I cannot begin to tell you the wild stuff that honeybees do. They are absolutely amazing. Mating, that's another thing. Okay, so drones are sexually mature at about two weeks. So in spring, they raise a lot of drones. They, because remember the colony is a super organism, which means it has to reproduce, okay? So they raise those drones getting ready for reproduction at a colony level, and that is called swarming. But first we're talking about mating. So drones, all they get to do, all they want is sex, you know? I know a lot of guys like that. Drones, that's what they live for is sex. They fly from the hive daily at about 10 o'clock and they go to specific areas in the sky that don't change from year to year. They're called drone congregation areas. Anywhere from about 20 to as high as 200 feet, average 60 feet up in the air along um, geographic markers like the edge of a stream or a field or um, you know woods but they stay fixed those locations. And virgin queens, when a virgin enters a drone congregation area, she'll be followed by a comet of drones who, and she'll mate with usually around 15, 20 of them. There was, I think one mating was recorded where she mated with 75 drones. The more drones she mates with, the better the genetic diversity in the colony. So, and the more vigorous the colony will be. So we want her to mate with lots of drones. She doesn't go out again, you know, she might go out like a second day if it's raining the first day, but she'll never go out more than twice. Um, and the drone dies when he mates. So his stuff is left in the queen's vagina. Um, it comes out with an audible pop and he falls over backward dead and, um, I think this is a great cartoon. <laughs> worth it, worth it. Honestly, it wasn't that great. <laughs> so um, that's all the drones get to do is mate. Swarming. This is a wonderful thing, okay? If you get a chance to see a swarm, it's a pretty cool thing. And I've had a chance to see quite a few. This was a very swarmy year. Lots of bees swarmed. Um, lots of colonies swarmed. And we have years like that, and we have other years where there's not so much. But it happens in spring during really good nectar flows. And what happens is the old queen will leave the hive with half or a little more than half of the population that goes with her. And they will bivouac on a nearby branch, hang out, and send scouts out in all different directions to look for a new home. So this is reproduction at a colony level. The bees that are left will raise a new queen. 
decay. They've started queen cells before the old queen left. And one of those queens will, will emerge, mate, and take over the old colony. But the new queen, I'm sorry, the old queen and all of these bees are looking for new digs. Okay, so how do they find this new real estate? They have specific standards for what constitutes a good home. And th that's what they're looking for. But the first thing they do is they hang out in a tree. They will find a nearby tree and they'll group on it. And I've got a little movie of a swarm clustering on this tree for you to see. Here again is where queen pheromone comes in, okay? So they can smell where the queen is with their antennae and they will go to where she is. And so you get this enormous ball, sometimes two in the same tree, okay, of bees hanging out right there. And from that location, from that location, they will send out several hundred scouts in all different directions looking for a new home. They have standards. I'll tell you what they are in a sec. The scouts come back and they dance on the surface of the swarm to tell their sisters about the new possible spot that they found. And they'll recruit their sisters, other scouts to go and look. The swarm doesn't move until everybody's agreed on the same spot. Don't you wish our democracies operated like that? Think about our last presidential election. We should be more like honeybees. So if I can find, if I find this swarm, or I see this swarm in the tree, okay, I can give them a home. So this is a case here where I put, I put a box under the swarm. It was low enough, I was able to shake them out of the tree or cut the branch and put the branch right on um, the box. And you're gonna see them actually marching in because usually they'll, they'll decide this is a really nice home and, um, and go right in. So that's what's happening here. Okay, um, so these are the standards of what's a good home. It should be about 15 feet high. That's ideal for them, you know. I give them such a nice spot on the ground that they can, they usually overlook that. <laughs> so, but in the wild, this is what they look for. Ideally, a cavity in a tree. The volume should be roughly 40 liters and the opening should be about two square inches. That's what they like. It, it's gotta have nectar sources nearby, should be at the edge of a forest. Um, and I love that they, they, they all agree before they leave for that spot. All two to 300 scouts agree that's the best spot. Um, you guys are into books. This is an amazing book and it's fine for lay people too. You don't have to be a beekeeper to understand it. Um, Honeybee Democracy by Thomas Seeley. He is a, um, a doctor of entomology up, um, actually, I think he's a doctor of um, comparative behavioral biology, but he's a beekeeper up at Cornell University. And uh, this is an uh, this book will blow your mind. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, we're almost done here. Winter, healthy bees survive very cold winters. Unlike wasps, which, as you'll recall, only the the mated females survive, and the hive dies. The rest of the colony dies. Um, but um, but honeybees can survive as a colony in the winter. Often they kick the drones out. Drones are of no use in winter. So if resources are scarce or they think it's gonna be very cold, 
sometimes they'll kick the drones out, just not, you know, push them out, they don't get to come back in. Um, bees are great thermoregulators. They actually, they have air conditioning in summer, they fan, they create a breeze through the hive and, um, and they will gather water and evaporate it for evaporative cooling in winter, in summer. But in winter, they form a cluster. So the inner cluster, the inner part of this cluster, it's just a big ball of bees. The inner part, they're fairly loose, but the outer two inches, they're very tightly packed and it forms an insulating shell. Um, and the ones on the inside eat honey and use the energy from the honey to shiver, generating heat. So when the ones on the outside get too cold, they change places with one of the bees on the inside. Around the winter solstice, they will start to raise brood again. The brood requires a temperature of 94 degrees Fahrenheit. So these bees will maintain the brood nest at 94 degrees Fahrenheit in February when the outside temperature might be as low as minus 10, okay? Absolutely incredible. Uh, we have a question. Yes. We don't know if we have enough time for this question. It <laughs> is, it's a, it's yeah. a biggie. How does global warming affect bees? That's a really interesting question. And it, I'll I can tell you from my own personal experience, it's changing the nectar flows. So as it affects plants, it affects bees. Um, on a larger scale, I don't know, but bees are great at regulating temperature. They, they really are the insect world's prime thermoregulators. So I would think that places in northern Canada, where now they really cannot overwinter bees, except inside warehouses, they're probably starting to be able to winter bees outside. Um, I'm finding our nectar sources are changing and the timing of the nectar sources is changing. So I'm getting nectars that I didn't get before. Um, it's interesting. Can't go into it more than that. I don't know. It's an evolving thing. Um, all of you know, honeybees are in trouble um, from a lot of reasons, pesticides, um, habitat loss, huge, uh, diseases. We've always had diseases and predators. This is, you know, we have bears around here and predators do like not only bees, but they not only honey, but they also eat uh, the brood protein and carbohydrates all in one. Um, I have electric fences around all my apiaries. This is the big one though. And you know, honeybee colony collapse disorder, which started in, you know, happened in 2006, um, got a huge amount of publicity. This is the real enemy of honeybees and not too many people are aware of it. It's, it's a small parasitic mite called the Varroa mite that vectors viruses, which kill the colony. Um, it is responsible for more dead bees than any other cause in the world. And it is the most serious threat to beekeeping globally. Um, it's been here since 1987. In 1990, we lost 80% of the managed colonies in the United States. That didn't get any publicity because it wasn't as sexy as bees disappearing, you know, but 80% of the managed colonies died because of the Varroa mite. Um, it suppresses the bees immune system. Okay, so it makes them more susceptible to disease and it vectors viruses. It damages the glands that they use to produce food for brood resulting in malnutrition. Um, it is a horrible, horrible parasite, and it, it, uh, we don't have any really good answers for the Varroa mite. We have to put in um, medications that kill the mites, but we're trying to kill a bug on a bug, you know, and they're, they're biologically very similar organisms. 
So many of the things that we put in the hives to kill the mites also damage the bees, sometimes killing um, queens and larvae. Um, it's really, it's not a good thing. There are the, the species of honeybee that this mite evolved on is the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana. And they have mechanisms to enable them to survive with Varroa, but our East, you know, our European honeybee does not. So, um, and the mites become resistant to the treatments that we use. Unfortunately, there's not much money for research firms to spend on this because think about the market. You know, if you have, if you have a drug that helps with cancer, there's going to be a huge market for that. So companies like Pfizer and, um, you know, other drug companies are highly motivated to produce new medications because they will get a lot of money by selling those medications. How many beekeepers are there? In this country, there might be on the outside, I'm going to say perhaps 6,000 commercial beekeepers in the United States. So we need research that costs millions. There's nothing that they're going to be able to produce that will have enough of a market to pay for that kind of research. So that's a real problem. Fortunately, we're really good at raising bees. You know, I marked about 30 queens today and we just, you know, the bees keep dying every year and we keep raising them. Circumstances where we're not doing pollination, like my bees don't get moved into pollination and they're much healthier. You know, a commercial, a large migratory commercial beekeeper with thousands of colonies, Tucker, you can't, he wants to step on the laptop. <laughs> um, is never going to get 2% losses. Their losses are, if they're a really good migratory beekeeper, they're going to be maybe 30%. Um, and they raise, you know, go back and raise more bees. But it's a problem, and I don't know how sustainable it is. A so, question? Oh, yes. Sorry. So uh, the beekeepers themselves are not a large uh, market. But right. what about the agriculture that depends on the migrating uh, beekeepers? Well, farmers are a somewhat larger market, but not very. Okay. How hmm. many farmers are there? Still not a lot of people. Um, the real, where the money should come from is people who like to eat food, right? That's everybody, but not a lot of people know or are aware of this issue. Mm -hmm. People say to me, you know, how are your bees doing? Because they're thinking about colony collapse disorder. Okay, which started in what, 2006 and ended in 2008. We haven't had that. Um, and it was never a particularly serious thing to begin with. It just got, lo got a lot of publicity. Um, you know, cell phones are killing bees, bees are disappearing. Um, you know, Einstein says that we're all going to become extinct within four years after the bees disappear. It was sexy. A mite is not a sexy thing, um, but it's a big problem for us. It's a huge problem for us. So what can you do? Support programs that provide grant money for honeybee research, particularly on Varroa. My own thinking is that, um, you know, maybe some of the CRISPR DNA research, if we could genetically engineer not the honeybee, but the mite to make it less destructive, that would be wonderful. And the mite exists in a closed ecosystem just with honeybees. Um, but it would take millions, you know, to do that. Um, support local beekeepers. Most honey on supermarket shelves comes from other countries, um, like China, which dumps honey onto the United States and really damages um, large migratory beekeepers, you know, trying to make a living. Um, 
a lot of honey that comes from other countries is contaminated with antibiotics like chloramphenicol, um, or they put sugar in it, or they put barley malt or other sweeteners, um, but it's not pure honey. If you get, you know, I, you don't have to come to the honey house here. There are other beekeepers in the area, but if you get your honey locally from a local beekeeper, you are at least guaranteed that it is 100% pure honey. It hasn't been overheated. It hasn't been micro filtered to remove the pollen. Um, it's the real deal. And if you can avoid using pesticides, avoid using pesticides if you have to use them. Okay, don't spray flowering plants and try to spray in the evening after the pollinators have already gone home to their wild nests or the bees have gone to their hives. So this here on the left, right, this is kind of our current style of landscaping. Excuse me, Tucker. And it's a desert. If you're a honeybee, that's a desert. There's it nothing. Certainly is. There. Yeah. Nothing to eat there. There's no flowering plants. Okay, over here on the white, right, you've got, you know, dandelions, you've got some bachelor's buttons, you've got, you know, wildflowers. That's what they need. So if you can bring yourself to leave a portion of your property wild, it'll be really good for pollinators. They like dandelions, clover, thistle, goldenrod, smartweed. Um, Japanese bamboo, unfortunately, and a lot of other wildflowers. Um, spotted knapweed is a bee plant and, and trees. In our area, the main honey sources mm -hmm, are trees, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. black locust, linden trees, um, tulip poplar. These are all really important sources for bees. And for pollen, those are honey sources. For pollen, maple trees, even oak trees. Um, so try and plant trees that are friendly to bees. Like I hate Bradford pears, not a drop of nectar in them, weak crowns, um, but linden trees, the linden trees that they planted a hundred years ago in Pine Brook, my bees are literally working today, getting delicious linden honey from. Um, they're, they're also known as basswood. Basswood is the larger leafed um, wild variety that you find in the woods. So mm -hmm. I'm talking the small leaf linden is what they have in Pine Brook. But yes, they're all uh, the tilia is the genus. Yeah, also and it's lime tree. Mm -hmm. um, but they are wonderful nectar producers. So if you're interested in learning more about plants that are good sources for bee honeybees in particular, go to njbeekeepers.org. Okay, there's an extensive list on that website um, of bee-friendly plants. If you can plant flowering things in July to October, for instance, Avodia danielli is a wonderful little 15-foot ornamental tree that produces nectar in late July. That's dearth when nothing is producing nectar. So it's if you can find things that bloom and produce nectar during that time, it's particularly good for the bees. Could I could I interject something? Go ahead. Um, I planted uh, uh, pignanthium muticum, With which is a, a mountain mint, mm -hmm. which is fabulous it is a, a truly a, a pollinator haven and if you can't plant a tree plant a mint they love all herbs so yes. any herbs that you plant are going to be attractive to a honeybee whether yes. it's basil any of the mints um oregano thyme sage they all are very attractive i know and that's it <laughs> So all right. <laughs> all right. Oh, look at your bee bra. <laughs> that's, that's my that's my bee kini. <laughs> oh, your bee kini? <laughs> my bee kini. <laughs> bee -kini. 
Oh, we have one, we have another question, Landy. Okay. I believe this comes from Lada, our director. She's asking about putting a hive in the Booten Homes library. We have a back garden. I, I know you said before you're familiar with the building. Um, we have a back garden that's actually being redone this summer. Okay. Um, is is there are there space requirements? Are there uh, garden? Well, uh, first are off, there, you you. You would need to, you're always better off starting with two highs, not just one. Um, two if you have, is fine. Pardon me? Two is fine. Okay. Because if you have a queen issue, like say mm. one hive goes queenless and you don't notice, you can actually use brood from the other hive to make the queenless hive right. So, um, having two is easier from a management perspective than just having one. Something you want to consider, you have to have an electric fence around the apiary. There's got to be enough room in the back so that you can work the bees from the back. Um, and you need four feet between the hives and the fence in all directions because bears can reach through and knock things. Some bears have very long arms. I can, I can assure you that we have no bears up in Putin. Yes, you do. We do? Yes, you do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> what? Yeah, that, they don't come through town often, but right. they, they do show up. Yeah. We have bears, trust me. Yeah. So so are there any like requirements that, you know, that the, the, the hives have to be X amount of feet from, from anybody? Lines? Yes. If you go on the... Um, um, First off, you'd have you're required by law to take a class, um, which, which actually I actually I took the class. You took that's right. You, you were in my class, weren't you? I was. This is why you're here, my friend. <laughs> that's right. Okay, <laughs> good. So on the um, Department of Agriculture's website, okay, yeah. New Jersey Department of Agriculture, go to the Division of Plant Industry. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. bee inspection okay? okay there will be um new jersey bee regs posted okay. on that page that you can access and it gives all of the details as far as setbacks from property lines um uh, requirements for water you know you have to provide a water source on site you have to manage to control swarming um there's a whole bunch of requirements sure uh, you know, none of them are anything that um, um, that a reasonable beekeeper wouldn't want to do. No, but, no, of um, course not. Yeah, but uh, but the 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 bear fence is critical, and and in a public area like the library, you know, you may have to put another fence around the bear fence just to keep little kids from blundering into it. You know what well, I? Well, you know, I I actually when I was at Harding Library, um, I one of the things that I really thought was very funny was that we put a 10,000 volt fence up. Um, and I was like, wow, this is the best way to keep, keep the kids in. Um, <laughs> oh. um, I have a question, Landy. Yes. So if, if you're not going to go all in and become a beekeeper yourself and and meet all these requirements. Are, can people host the um, the hives of uh, of certified beekeepers if they have nice land or appropriate land? Yes, yes, they can. Um, if you're interested in doing that, the thing to do would be to contact your local chapter of the New Jersey Beekeepers Association to see, you know, and then they would send out. Now, my chapter, I go to the even though we're in Morris County. The Essex County chapter meets in Roseland versus Chester, which is where the Morris County chapter meets. So I'm a member of Essex because it's like 20 minutes away as opposed to 45 minutes away. And it's a great club. But if you emailed us, um, you email me and I can, you know, get a, um, um, an email out to our membership to see if anyone is interested. There are also beekeepers who do, I know a young beekeeper who does concierge beekeeping. 
and for uh, a fee, you know, he will manage bees for you on your property. You own the bees, you own the equipment, um, and you own the honey. And you pay you pay him a fee. Pretty cool. It's an interesting, uh, interesting niche he's found there. Yeah, I think <laughs> kind of the only one who does that, but but uh, yeah, he's got some got some good clients, some fairly well to do clients, and mm -hmm. they have bees on their property. They don't want to manage the bees. They don't want to mess with the bees, but they like having bees on their property and they like getting the honey. Okay. You know what? I bet you he has some some clients in Hardy. He probably does. Yeah, you know, sure he has clients in Morristown. And yeah, he, he worked for me for about a year and a half. He's a great kid, really nice young man. And he's an excellent, he's a good young beekeeper too. Okay. So All he, right. He's the bee the master beekeeper in that no. situation. Oh, he's not. No, he's okay. not a master beekeeper. That's okay. a specific title. I'm an EAS certified master beekeeper. It means I've passed four very rigorous examinations and have, um, which I took after I had a minimum of five years experience with recommendations from existing master beekeepers. And I passed an exam, um, oral exam, field exam, written exam, laboratory exam. Oh my goodness. Examinations last two days. Wow. And roughly. Oh God, makes being a librarian like a breeze. <laughs> Roughly two thirds <laughs> of the people that take these exams fail them. So, Is that right? Wow. It's wow. A, so I, I, I run that program now for the Eastern Apiculture Society. I'm in charge of the, um, um, the certification committee. So now, we have you know, a group of candidates that we test every year um, mm -hmm. at our annual conference. Um, how you have other animals at the farm. Uh, are there any interaction issues? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, let's see. My dog, Indiana Bones, comes to work <laughs> <laughs> So he's a bee dog. And uh, his job is basically if we get too many bees in the truck, he has to take care of business. It's his job to get rid of the bees in the truck. So he's developed this special snapping motion like this, right? Where he, where he can somehow manage to kill the bee before she stings anybody, me or him, and without getting stung himself, and then he eats her. And if there's too many bees, he hides under the truck. <laughs> okay, so what so do you mean if there's too many bees in the truck? Well, you know, if I'm... I mean, sometimes I'll have bees on my veil or something when I, or in, on my jacket when I get back in the truck to leave. And I mean, usually I manage to get them out by just opening the windows, but um, occasionally one will get in the back and, and Indy, you know, has to take care of it. <laughs> it's <laughs> he so knows, funny. He knows all about bees. Um, he's, it's interesting. He's actually immune to the venom. Nothing happens if he gets stung, just like me. <laughs> Uh, we've both been stung so many times that we have immunity. So we don't swell okay. up. We don't get red or itch. Yeah, or just like. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happens. Um, bees and horses from what I, I don't have horses. Um, but from what I understand, that's not a good combination. Huh. Uh, well, that's interesting. You know what? I, I, I actually have a couple of good friends who have bees and horses. And I'm going to have to ask them. Yeah, I, I imagine if the hives were far enough away, it wouldn't be an issue, but you wouldn't want to put them right together. Yeah. No, probably not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have one more quick question for you. Okay. Um, what is the address of the honey house? Okay. Well, you can just Google gooserockfarm.com. Okay. And I put Google that Maps, in chat before. Yep. Google Maps will take you right there, right okay. here. So the honey house is at the farm. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, a lot of Laura Krauss, our colleague Laura Krauss, um, told me about the honey house. She goes there for her, her honey. Meat. Familiar. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a. It's it's different. It's self service. 
So because I'm never, you know, I'm rarely yeah. here. I'm out managing the bees and the bees are in Pinebrook and Tuaco. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the only time I actually have bees here is usually if I'm bringing a nuke from one place, a nuke is a nucleus colony, not a explosive <laughs> device. <laughs> I'm not a terrorist, I promise. <laughs> yeah, that's what they won't see. Um. <laughs> So, so I rarely so, have bees here. It's not a great spot for bees right here. But this, ah, okay. this is where I extract honey and sell honey and live. Um, and um, we have some and have equipment and do everything else. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, Landy, thank you so much for tonight. This was this was great. And thank and you. um I'm hoping that we can do more of these uh, because the more we can we can educate. And I love that you did the wasps and and really talked about those too because you know what those little fellows are part of our ecosystem. Yeah, they are, and they're important. Yeah, I know. Um, and the EPA has just allowed another round of synthetic neonics, and I hate these people. Um, we need to we need to get there. I know. I'll take the neonicotinoids if you can get rid of the varroa mites for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have the pesticides, quite honestly. <laughs> Is that right? That's yeah. so interesting. Hmm. Yeah, the varroa mites are far more damaging than neonicotinoids. Hmm. Is that right? Oh yeah. Okay, so of magnitude more. Yes. So what can we? What? I, I, how can we? How can we make? How can we make us think about this? Now my job. I'm a <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. All right. Well, well, thank you so much. And thank this was this much. was so much fun. And, I enjoyed it too. And and thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, Landy. Okay. Thank you, thank Landy. You all. Take care. Say Bye -bye. hello to say hello to your Ethiopian beekeeper friend. I will. I will do that. <laughs> you have an Ethiopian okay. beekeeper friend? I do. Yes. Yes. He said hello to us. He said Maya, Landy. <laughs> Actually, I also have beekeeper friends in Malawi and in um, um, one other country that I forgot. <laughs> what other yeah. African country? I have three African <laughs> beekeeping friends. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. All right. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, well, Landy. Landy. We'll all take care now. Okay. Good night, Bye -bye. everybody. Thank you Good for night, attending. Everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.